Thank you, Richard. We're on, good. So I've been praying about this passage and this sermon for a while, and I know that the idea of Jesus calling us to love his world, to make disciples, I know that's not new. We've heard this before. And what's encouraging to me is Jesus knew that telling people about him wasn't going to be simple. It wasn't going to be without cost in order that he said to his disciples, look, I've suffered and I'm your teacher and they will do to you what they've done to me. So he knew that it wasn't an easy thing to tell people about God. And he knew because he'd done it for three years and some people had received him well and others wanted to kill him. So he knew it was challenging. But Jesus explained over time that it was God's plan that people would be saved um, by faith in him, but because his brothers and sisters brought those people to a place where they could meet him. So as he leaves, he commissions them, go and find others, bring them to me, make them into disciples and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And what started with those first disciples still applies to us. And it continues with us. And it continues in, in one of two ways. It either continues until we die and we go to be with the Lord. And then we stand before him. And he says, what have you done with your life? And he looks at his book and he says, I'll tell you. Or it continues until the point where his work is complete. And then the Bible tells us the final trumpet sounds and the king of love returns because his work is complete. Because, and sometimes perhaps as we get older, it's harder to, to get hold of this. At some point, some generation of people will be the people who see Jesus come back. You know, the Bible has given many conditions for the return of Jesus, many tasks for the church globally to do. Things like um, the, the Bible being translated into every language, things like every creed, creed and tribe and tongue reached and witnessed to. There are a number of things, even though Jesus said only the Father knows, there are a number of aspects to the commission that Christians have been told through the word. And we are without excuse when it comes to what God has said to us. No one will stand before him and say, I didn't know. We won't even be able to speak words like that. He'll just say, I will tell you who you were. And so at some point, a generation will be the one who hears that final trumpet call. And yeah, the world will shake and the old will pass away and the new will come and it will be terrifying. But it will also be phenomenal because there will be a generation of Christians who will know that they were there when that trumpet sounded and they'd done all that God required and the time was right, the net was full, however we image it. And thinking about that, I mean, I started off as a missionary in YWAM and Youth of the Mission always push this great commission. I've always wanted to be part of that generation. I don't mind dying when the Lord says my time is up and going to him and standing before him. I'd like to be there at the end, wouldn't you? You know, how many more generations do we want to see come? How long do we want it to go on? Christians have more power than they often accept, more responsibility often than we want. And thinking about that, I just wanted to say a little bit this morning about two things. One about conviction and the other about the urgency for mercy. Um. Easter is this time when mercy comes out so, so greatly because of the work of the cross, but conviction. Now, conviction, when it comes to our faith in Jesus, conviction represents to me how seriously we trust in and how faithfully we believe and live out the words of Jesus and the commands of scripture. I want to say a little about conviction without using some of the, lib the labels that people use in our world, words, words like 
liberal or evangelical. I want to simply recognize that conviction for Christians is a relatively simple matter. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no, didn't he? He didn't say, don't make vows, don't make promises. That's why I wouldn't have promised to the king the other week because I've already promised to that king and it's Jesus. And the only other human I've ever promised to is my wife. So he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so conviction is a simple matter of being faithful to what he has told us to do, what the word says. You know, there's a worship song that says, and it's poetic, so allow the license in it. We will give ourselves no rest until your kingdom comes on earth. In the poetry of that, we recognize, um, actually, we can't work like that. We are people who need rest. God modeled rest. God commanded us to rest. Sabbath was a part of who we are. But that song expresses an attitude of heart which is an undivided heart and our world is very good at dividing us up we have a bit here and a bit there there are many pulls many requirements on us but an attitude of an undivided heart helps us to be convicted convicted as christians now christians throughout history have had movements towards simplicity I was listening to a devotion this week about the vine and the branches and the pruning. And it says the the, the vine owner only lets the most fruitful thing grow because lots can be showy, but it's simplicity which brings the good fruit. And I recognize in me and in us, sometimes we have so many things going on. That makes conviction quite challenging for us as Christians. We have so many pulls so many requirements, so many things we choose to do and some we have to do that we struggle sometimes to be focused and and convicted about, about our faith in Jesus. You know, at times in our lives, we've all been very consumed in things. You know, it might be puppy love, your first love, you were consumed by it. It might be, sadly, you're a Portsmouth fan. And you're consumed by, unless there's some, yeah, I know, crazy. Um, There's some madness to you where you've always just been so wholehearted about them. But because we're Christians, we're called to be convicted like that for the gospel, for the sake of Christ. And this is not for a post-it note, which have all fallen on the floor now. Those ones do not get a good Amazon rating as stickiness. But on a scale of one to 10, think for yourself, when when were you the most convicted of your need to be part of the Great Commission? Is it today? Or is it when you were younger? Do you feel as you've got older, it's less of a concern? Think about that for a second. If you think you used to be much more zealous in your convictions of christ than you are today take away and think about what might need to change or what has got in the way what other things have grown that need to be pruned back think about that and if there's none praise god teach me because we all struggle and then the other thing i wanted to say was about the urgency for mercy you know easter is our ever present reminder each year that the mercy of god has overridden the justice we were due for our sins the mercy of god through christ has set us free from the punishment that we should receive for our sinfulness and that's joyful isn't it it's a joyful thing to know that jesus died on the cross and set you free from the cost of death isn't it absolutely it is joyful that we are overwhelmed in gratitude for what he did for us on the cross. But you know what? Mercy, mercy is not, um, it's not like Maltese teasers in that tub of celebrations, which nobody wants to share. Mercy is the thing we have to share. It's the most important thing that we're giving away. We recognize that we have received mercy and we give it away to others. It must be 
contagious from us and communicated by us. See, mercy changes us. I had mercy on that flight then, because now look at it, it's giving me, giving me joke. I saw that in here on the other day and it was chasing people everywhere. Look, mercy, mercy changes us or it should change us. Mercy should make us moved. It should make us feeling. It should make us caring towards the lost around us. Even the people who are horrible to us out there. Mercy should make us recognize that we've been rescued and that is phenomenal. But what about everyone else? You know, in the past few weeks, I've taken a few funerals and I've been surrounded by people who need the mercy of God. And I've been reminded of how lost some of them are. And it reminded me as I felt sadness at their loss of how much it hurts my heart to see a lot of the lost people around us. Sometimes we see the world around us as them and not us. But we are all people, all loved by God. And yet we are the ones at this present moment, often in our streets, sometimes the only ones who know Jesus. And the mercy we have, we need to get to them so that those countless lost people can find the good shepherd. So like the story tells, the picture says, so he can pick them up and carry them home. And the Great Commission is where Jesus has told us, I'm sending you to tell them about me so I can do that. And it doesn't happen without those messengers. So as we think of the need of the urgency of mercy, I don't think we can live well or fully or should be comfortable while we know that large parts of the world around us is unreached. While we know that there are people who you smile at day by day. I, I'm assuming you smile at people. Um, while there are people that you see who are going to hell. That shouldn't leave us comfortable, should it? You know, we've got neighbours, a number of neighbours, but Ken and Pat next door that some of you who have been in the church a long time will have seen. Getting old, getting frail. And I keep saying, Lord, how do I help them find you? Because they've got perhaps less years than some of the other younger ones around us. But the urgency of mercy must help us to reach out. And let's be practical for ourselves. If we can get to the end of a week, however you define your week, you know what a week is. If seven days have passed and in seven days, you haven't at least shared a little of the gospel or a little of your faith or given a little of the love of God away, then is that comfortable for you fundamentally? I think if we get to the end of a week and we haven't done one of those things, then something is missing in the way we live. Something is missing in the priorities we have before God as people of this gospel that we proclaim. And the good news is lots of that happens because we've said we can see the evidence of things happening, whether it be in a boys' brigade, in a girls' brigade, through the kids' work, through the cafe on a Wednesday, through um, conversations that we have. Some of that is happening. But the Great Commission requires that mercy is core within us because we trust in the mercy that we've received from God through Jesus. So we are to act, this commission says, out of compassion and care to go, to be conduits of mercy, to connect to others humbly and with understanding. I, I'm reading a book at the moment about a lady whose husband was separated from her and he killed himself. He was addicted to heroin and he went away and committed suicide. And she's talking about how unique her life is and how she's found it hard to be understood. And it just reminded me, sometimes we see people around and we think we really know them. We, we think we understand them, but we need to give them space to tell their story and to help them by saying in our story that Jesus has helped us through the uniqueness of our own struggles, our own trials. See, Jesus' 
um, lavished great mercy on you, hasn't he? And me. Praise him for that. Mercy from Jesus, it triumphs over judgment. It triumphs over everything, over violence, over bad life experiences, over the injustices that we face. All suffering, violence and greed and evils in our world are washed away because of the mercy of Jesus. That's our testimony at heart. That's what he's done for so many of us. Scripture says, Micah tells us, what does the Lord require of you? To, to walk justly and to love mercy and to be humble before people. Our time is gone. Perhaps you could take away one other thing to think about. And, and if you thought about it, for you and you have an answer, I'd like to hear your answer. Um, what can help us where we need to, to increase our church's focus on the Great Commission? What can help us? What are the things we should be doing? Think about what, what you should be doing. And I have to say, one of the main reasons I'm here with the deacons is to help you serve the Lord. So if you, if you take this away and you think about it and you think, Ken, actually, I want to do this, I'm going to say something. We're here to help you, help you reach people. And God has blessed us with wonderful facilities that, praise God, were spruced and cleaned on Saturday again. This is here that mercy might flow, isn't it? This is why we've got it, that people might get saved. So what can help us to increase our focus, our living out this great commission? Think about that. And if you want to say anything to me at any point, just come and say it. Um, I would greatly appreciate that. Listen, we're going we're gonna to have our closing um, hymn of worship. Uh, we're going to sing Shine, Jesus, Shine. It is, as they say, a modern banger. Um, it's a very lovely song of worship. We know it. We can celebrate 